17. We're going to look at the second part of Paul's message on Mars Hill as he preaches creation evangelism. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul has come to a place there the Areopagus is mentioned in verse 19. Now remember this is like a, 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 a rock uh, that uh, has stairs that goes up to it and then has uh, a seating on the top. And as he stands to preach, the Parthenon is in the background as he's... Uh, given this opportunity to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, look what he would, um, as he says in verse 22, And then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed by, and behold, their devotions, your devotions, I found an altar with an ins this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord and heaven of earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Sith he giveth to all life and breath and all things, hath made one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone or graven by an art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now hath commanded all men everywhere to repent. So as Paul is standing there on the Areopagus, of Mars Hill, in front of all these Epicureans and Stoics that have gathered together. The, neither one of them believe in their God. One focuses on experience. Uh, one says that God is everywhere in pantheism and is in all things. And as now he sees all these gods. And as one historian said, you could find a God just as easy as you could find a human uh, there in Athens because uh, of their worship of all the gods, the Greek gods, and uh, God is everywhere and in everything to be worshipped, and then all the, the Greek gods, of course. But Paul focuses on there is a cause. As he's walked around Athens and seen the, the sinfulness of man, the heathenness of man, and all their gods... He tells us that uh, certainly that uh, they need the one true God. And he sees this uh, inscription to the unknown God. In other words, in case they missed a God, uh, they just made an inscription. Uh, in case we left out one, this is to him. And Paul said, you did leave out one God, and that's uh, the one true God. And of course, uh, the heathen... Uh, of mankind and the depravity of their worship brought out to Paul that man is a sinner. And he brought out, therefore, whereby one man's sin entered into the world. And we heard about the sinfulness of man, that there's none righteous, no, not one, and the depravity of man, as he would, I believe, bring out uh, the thoughts of Romans chapter 1, that man is, is serving uh, the creation and not the creator. And certainly we see in this day in which we live that uh, man 
uh, is uh, stooped in immorality and sin, whether it be humanism, hedonism, atheism, materialism, and secularism, that uh, there is no God, uh, God's not involved in, in anything, there's no heaven, there's no hell. When you die, that's just the end of it all. So we hear from our world, you only go around once in life, so get all the gusto you can. Party, live it up. So what are they telling these uh, millennials in uh, the Generation Z and the next one just coming up? Well, there is no God, just party. So that's what they're getting ready to do the month of March uh, with all the spring breaks and the wickedness and the drunkenness. There is no God. And sad to say there are going to be some that's going to drink themselves uh, to death or some going to be partying and uh, all the things that's going to be going on. Well, what do you expect? When you have all these isms and philosophies, and Paul is trying to say uh, to these Greeks, uh, man is a sinner, and there is a God. So he draws their attention, not only as we see uh, about the sinfulness of man, there's a cause, because there is a creator. Notice uh, as he draws uh, their attention, uh, to God the Creator there's something that he brings out notice what he says the God that made the world and all things therein you see again this lie and the lies of the devil are being pumped into young people and to our college students and to moms and dads and to all of us and if you tell a lie big enough loud enough long enough then maybe people will believe it well, lies like there is no God, there is no creator, uh, there is no gender, or we, you don't even know what you are, uh, and you can change what you are if you want to. So the lies that Satan keeps telling, but Paul brings it back. Yes, there is a God. Yes, there is uh, an accountability. And yes, because there's accountability for man's actions, he's drawing their attention that God, as he said, that made the world and all things therein. Again, I like Isaiah that says in Isaiah 42 and verse 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, and he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. What a wonderful truth. You know, to realize that creation makes more sense than evolution. I'll never forget what uh, Henry Morris said many years ago, and I've never forgotten it. He said it takes more faith to believe evolution than it does creation. Because all the evidence points toward there is a Creator. Now again, I know we don't just argue uh, from order and design, but again, uh, you can look at your human body and see, oh, that there must be a design behind this uh, beautiful creation that God has made, the human body. When you think about the brain, when you think about the bloodstream, when you think about uh, uh, all that God has made in this wonderful design of His creation. But not only that, Go outside tonight and look up at the stars and say, oh, what a beautiful accident. Oh, no. You can say, what a beautiful design by our God, the Creator. And what did uh, Hosea tell us? He created the heavens. He put the earth right where He wanted it. He gave us the gravity, just exactly what we needed. And to realize that when man leaves this planet, he needs to take part of this planet with him as I've uh, toured the uh, uh, Huntsville Space Museum uh, about a year or so ago when I was down there with my grandkids. And it was a reminder of all the things that we need to take with us when we leave this planet. Even to realize that when man gets in space, all the things that he needs, oxygen and exercise and all the complications. Why? Because God put us right on this world, right where he wanted us. And we're right here because there is a creator. But again, he draws their attention, not only the greatness of God, but the goodness of God. In verse 25, 
Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. You see, he just blew the Greek philosophy and gods out of the water. Because we serve a God that loves us and gives for us and died and gave His Son upon the cross. And Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He tells us in James 1 and verse 17 that every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. Oh, the Bible tells us in Romans 2, 4 that the goodness of God should lead men to repentance. So what is, what is Paul doing to these uh, Greeks that don't understand creation? They don't have Genesis. They don't have the Old Testament. They've had Greek mythology and, and uh, atheism that's been pushed down their throats and that God is in everything and everywhere and all these gods. He said, no, there's one true God. And you know what? He loved you. He died for you. But He also is good to you. And isn't it wonderful to know that Paul said in Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'll never forget the illustration many years ago. Melanie and I often talk about it. That if you were placed in a, in a, in a cell and there was one little uh, uh, opening at the bottom, and after a while, the things that you needed kept coming through that box. Food and your daily sustenance. And pretty soon, maybe when you were, were cold, a, a blanket was given to you. And things just keep coming uh, through that little hole. And uh, you, you would eventually come to the place where you would say, there must be somebody on the other side that knows my needs and is taking care of me. And I don't know about you, but all these years of being a Christian and realizing that God, somebody's meeting my needs. Somebody's taking care of me. Somebody has given me everything. Not only my needs, but you know what? He is so good to me that sometimes He gives me my wants. That's the kind of God that I'm serving. There's somebody out there and He's our God and He's good to us to realize now He calls our attention, uh, Paul does in this sermon, not only the greatness of God, the goodness of God, but He reminds them of the government of God. That God one day will rule this world. Oh, not now. He's been rejected. But He calls their attention in verse 26, "...and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation." What is He talking about? He's saying there's only one race. There's only one race. And it's called the human race. And the Bible tells us that in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. To realize that God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You see, this has just shot down everything about evolution. Because evolution says, we're, we're just animals. We're just advanced form of animals. But God said, no, He made man in His image to, to have dominion, to rule over His creation. And what a wonderful thought to know. You see, that would deal and take care of a lot of the hatred that's in our world today, to realize that we're all in the image of God. You see, the Greeks had taught that they were a special race. But Paul was saying, oh no, we're all made in the image of God and there's one race. 
Again, it's interesting that when God humbled Nebuchadnezzar, you remember who was that image of gold, that times of the Gentiles that God would prophesy that would exist for uh, many, many years. And after Nebuchadnezzar was humbled and uh, brought back to his senses, listen to what he says. I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And He doth according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay His hand or say unto Him, what doest thou? To realize what Paul was trying to say to them in these verses, verse 28 and verse 29, is that we are the offspring of God. What he was saying here is, we were made in the image of God and given an eternal soul. But how sad now that it's become that, God, that Paul is saying that God made us in His image and how foolish for us to make gods in our image and then worship them. I'm thankful that Jesus said, or, or, or John said in uh, John chapter 1 and verse 12, He said, To as many as received Him, to, give, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And what Paul is saying to uh, these Greeks on Mars Hill, he's saying that one day this God is going to rule all of the earth and all of mankind. He says, For the times of His ignorance... God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. So what is He saying now? He's saying there is a cause, there is a Creator, and there is coming a condemnation. A condemnation. That God will one day judge the world in righteousness that by man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance to all men, and that hath raised Him from the dead. In other words, God has demanded now that men through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ put their trust in Him. Paul explained it this way in Romans chapter 3 in verse 25 when he said, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance that means a long suffering of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Again, listen a little bit later as uh, we have recorded in the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. As we see that Paul says, And I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is Paul saying to these Greeks that are worshiping all kind of gods? He's saying there is a cause because man is a sinner. He's saying there is a creator. Yes, there is a creator. You were made in the image of God. There is an accountability. And there is a coming condemnation. I close with what Peter would tell us 
in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Listen to what he says. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. Now it's one thing to be ignorant that you just don't know. But it's another thing to say, I don't want to know. My mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Now notice what Peter says in the last days. There's going to be three things that men will willingly say, I don't want to believe it. I don't care what science says. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the evidence says all around me. I don't want to believe it. Three things. Notice what he says. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What is that? That's creation. That's creation. Let's get rid of God in our schools, in our homes, in our colleges, in our educational, in our judicial. Let's take God out and get rid of a God. Well, what happens when you do that? Anarchy. Chaos. We don't know what a family is. We don't even know what a male or a female is according to the world now. And it's plaguing. Why? Because we threw out God in creation. Well, what else is going to happen? Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The word is a cataclysm. And what is that? The flood. You see, if the world has to admit that there was a flood, I'm talking about a universal worldwide flood, not some kind of local flood, then if they can get rid of that, then they can say that God didn't judge man because of his sin. Let's get rid of that. So what do they do? They laugh, they scoff. The evidence points toward a global flood. Well, we're not going to believe that either. But notice what else. But the heavens and the earth which are now, right now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In other words, they're going to deny the coming of the Lord. And that's why Paul says in verse 8, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. As we said this morning, what is, what is, what is Peter saying here? Now remember back what he said, scoffers saying, uh, wh wh where is this coming? You Christians have been talking about this coming of the Lord for 2,000 years. We don't see nothing like that. We don't believe that. Well, Paul said, or Peter saying, well, with God, it's, it's only been like two days. With God, a 1,000 years is just like one day. It's like God just said it not 2,000 years ago. But just a couple of days ago. He, he's coming. Oh, we're, we're in the last days. I believe that. But you know, Paul was preaching to these heathen that didn't want to believe in a God. And thank God there were some conversions. As we close the book, uh, the chapter in 34, there were, there were some, uh, some women and others who came to Christ that listened. Listened. And I hope that you and I can convince this world that wants to be willingly ignorant. Yes, there is a Creator. There is a Creator. There is 
a cause and there is coming condemnation. Father, I believe that, as Peter said, that in the last days, I believe we're there. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to continue like Paul to say, I don't care what science says. Uh, yes, you, you, you didn't evolve through millions of years. You were created in the image of God and have an eternal soul and you're going to spend eternity somewhere, heaven or hell. And you're going to give an account of your life. And Revelation says they were judged out of the books and the books were the works and the lives that people lived. Lord, help us. Help us in these latter days to, to bring this world back. That there is a cause. Man is a sinner. There is a creator. And there is a coming condemnation. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.